you're going. Oh, he didn't tell me we were starting already. There's a countdown. There's no countdown. Yeah, there's a countdown now. Oh, it doesn't show on my screen. So. Oh, all right. Ready? Click start. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. What's going on, Andrew? Not much. This is a Just different another, intro. Another, another day here in the, uh, in the Auto Off Topic separate studios, and I was not prepared to do an intro, so... I, uh, you asked to deferring do it that, last time. I, yeah, but you didn't tell me I was going to do it. I've been deferring that to you for so long now. I totally, uh, totally forgot. You forgot the name of the podcast? No, I didn't forget the name of the podcast. I just forgot I was supposed to do it, so I had everything prepared. Okay. Welcome to the show of... I'm glad to be here. ...shows, Andrew. What's going on tonight, Andrew? What are you up to? Uh, we have got another Dirt Rally Championship going live. Uh, I yeah. set it up. Due to popular demand, so it, instead of going live at twelve noon on Friday, it's going to go live at twelve a.m. Friday. So Friday and night we'll, into Saturday. Nope, Friday at twelve a.m. So Thursday so, into Friday. Yep, and for three days. Okay. And each event is three days. I uh, I'm very happy that you did it for the midnight change instead of noontime. I was one of the ones who asked because I would. With the time change between Massachusetts and Arizona, which is only two hours, but for some reason it screws me up completely, I kept missing the rallies because it's like, oh, I'll do it right after work. And I go to do it right after work and it ended at noon and I screwed up. Yeah. So I don't know what that has to do with the time change, but. Yeah, so I changed them and. Well, no, if you wanted, if you waited till the last day and you wanted to do it at like your lunchtime, take a lunch break and do it, it was already over. Right, that's the that's um, part of the problem. So, for this one, we're doing the same cars, R5 class, the entire championship, six events. Starts in Monty, and I don't know, I don't remember what the rest ones are. R5? I, it might have gone, Mon- yeah, all, all R5 class, yeah. So, R5 is all-wheel drive modern rally cars? Yes. Okay. So, like, all modern, like, Fiestas? Okay, I like driving Focus. those. They're fun. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's way too many settings well. in the suspensions, so I screw that up every time. But they're uh, they're fun to drive when they're set up right. So I look forward to that one. Mm-hmm. Any corrections? Uh, so speaking of racing cars, we had a few people reach out based on our conversation from last week. We chatted about uh, iconic racing liveries. All. I'll let you take this because I, I think you owe me the win here. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So we chatted about iconic racing liveries, uh, and we were having a hard time coming up with some standard American ones from the big three. We were comparing them to, like, Toyota and the, you know, three-stripe Toyota racing colors that were a corporate standard. Um, and I will, I'll jump right into it because I shot Andrew down that the good wrench racing scheme you know the the famous dale earnhardt racing scheme was was not an iconic racing livery other than just for nascar because in my brain every good rich car is a nascar car well it turns out that uh, i am completely wrong and the good wrench paid scheme does go across multiple motorsports forms so there's a gtp corvette from the 90s that ran the same livery there were some drag cars you know, going back to Warren Johnson in the early 80s, um, up through the mid-90s, the Warren Johnson car. Um, there were some Corvette Le Mans cars, like uh, the GT1 class. I'm not sure what class it is, Andrew. If you can yeah. GT1. It eventually became the yellow C5R. GT1. They're prototypes. Yeah. When the car first came out, there was a black and silver Goodwrench sponsored version of it, so... The, the scheme does go across all forms of motorsports, so I will secede to Andrew and say that he is correct, and Goodrich is the Chevrolet factory color, almost. It's almost like factory race team. On that same vein... Um, I'll take it. All right. On that same vein, uh, we quickly discussed the Tritone Blue Ford Motorsport logos, but we totally looked over the Ford equivalent to Goodrich, Probably because we were not talking about Goodwrench very much because I shot it down quickly. But uh, friend of the show, Ron, 
got with me over text message and was like, hey, this is uh, one you missed, the Ford Motorsport livery. So it's the red. Usually it's red with like gradient stripes of the same color. Yeah, Motocraft, sorry. Um, So the Motocraft logo is the iconic livery for Ford. Uh, And it does go across all forms of motorsports as well. There are desert trucks. There are IMSA cars. There are NASCAR, drag racing. I mean, everybody's, it's been in every form of motorsport. So 100%, that is definitely one of them too. Um, He thought about it because in his brain, he thought of the Willie T. Ribs uh, Mercury Capri that ran IMSA in the 80s, early 90s. So he thought of that and then he started thinking of other ones. And, you know, the Wood Brothers ran it for a long time on their number 21 NASCAR uh, Bill Elliott ran motocraft for a while in NASCAR. Um, there was, like I said, some some stadium trucks, some desert trucks, definitely some drag vehicles. So it goes across all of them as well, and possibly even an Indy car. So that was that was a big one. And the third one that came up, I think, was brought up by another friend of the show over Instagram was the um, Mopar. Yeah, team Judge Mills. Mopar. Over. Yeah, team team yeah. Mopar. Yeah, Judge Mills and Instagram. Uh, yep. Team Mopar. So that was through the 80s and 90s. So it was kind of the Toyota stripe colors with a couple extra colors thrown in. Uh, and they'd usually separate white and black paint jobs. So I know that was pretty iconic in desert racing. Yeah, and now it just looks like a Dutch Brothers paint scheme. Like the coffee place out west. Yes, the Dutch Brothers colors are the same. Yeah, exactly. But that, that was the color scheme they did. So it'd be usually the car was black on top, white on the bottom. Um, and it had kind of a, like a stripe that would start midway in the front wheel well and kind of come up at a curve and then straight down the back of the car. And it was a like a orange, yellow, and red, but also had a blue and a silver maybe in it. And then I've, I've seen that and everything's, like I said, it's pretty iconic in desert racing on the Dodge trucks. I've seen it on sprint cars, drag cars, NASCARs, everything. So the official name for that livery is Team Mopar. So I guess I should have known that one being the Mopar no car guy, huh? That's right. I blew it. Big fail. I blew it. To be fair, I've never owned. Hey, we figured it out, though. People did have answers. Yeah, they did. So those are the three. I guess I'd say they're the big threes, three iconic color schemes. There were other ones too. We touched on like AMC had the red, white, and blue cars across all their racing forms, but they're not the big three anymore because they're gone. So, <laughs> but that's a little a little bit of correction from people listening. So, thank you all for putting suggestions in, and uh, just to let you know we are actually listening to them. So, good. I like being corrected. It means it means people are listening, <laughs> which is important. Yeah. Do you get any Project Car updates? Oh, I do. Um, is it an update if the car hasn't gotten any better? Uh, stasis? Project Car Stasis? Stayed the same? So Project yeah. Car Stasis on the Starion. Where did we leave off, Andrew? Had I done a full tune-up yes. yet? Yes. Or we not talk about that in the podcast? No, nope, okay, we, we did. did. Okay. So I did a full tune-up and nothing worked. So the next step was to go... And do the uh, Starion owners and owners of vehicles from the 80s that don't have multi-port injection will know this. Um, the idle speed control TPS reset. So it involves like 17 steps. You have to get the engine up to operating temperature. Once the engine's up to operating temperature, you shut it off. You have to unplug the idle speed controller turn the ignition on so that sets itself back to um, wherever it's supposed to be like prime, like zero. Once you hear that thing move, then you start the car again and you loosen up the throttle position sensor and you pin out the throttle position sensor with, according to the factory service manual, a jumper harness, but I don't have that, you know, Mitsubishi special part. So I used a couple of T-handled needles to put them in the top of the connector. And then you put your voltmeter on the connector and you dial the connector left and right until it, you know, hits the recommended voltage in the throttle position sensor, 
which on this particular car is 0.48 volts and says plus or minus, you know, 0.2 is okay. So I made sure to get it right at 0.48 because I didn't want any kind of messing it up. So was it off? A little bit. Wasn't off enough to cause any issues, but it was off a little bit. So anyway, I got it all back together. Everything's reset. Get the car fired up. It cleared up a little. Um, it revs a little better, but it still falls flat in its face at like four grand. Like flat, flat in its face. Like it just there's it just stalls. So something is still amiss. So the next step is going to be, I'm pretty sure it's fuel because if it was spark, I don't think it would idle at all. I don't think it would rev at all. I don't think it would have any. It wouldn't run as good as it does below four grand. So I don't think it's a spark issue. I think it's got to be a fuel issue up higher. So having gone through all the fuel system except for the filters, the filters are next. Um, the one in the tank is going to be impossible to change based on the rust situation on the top of the tank. So we're just not going to change that one. Um, but we will change the one under the hood. because Bolted to the frame rail shouldn't be too hard. Um, when I do that, I'm going to replace the line going from the filter to the fuel injectors. And I'm going to put an inline fuel pressure gauge to see where the fuel pressure is. Because possibly I'm thinking that that pump we put in, being a cheap aftermarket pump, is maybe not pushing enough fuel for what's required to run the car up higher. That's possible. The other possibility would be I could bypass the factory fuel pressure regulator and just run a gauge and an inline pressure regulator between the filter and the injectors. So that way I could dial it to exactly where the factory settings are supposed to be and eliminate that, you know, unknown fuel pressure from the other side of the pressure regulator into the injectors. Cause there's no, there's no hose between the pressure regulator and the injectors where I could test the pressure. It's kind of like, a, I have to assume the pressure regulator is good because I'd put a gauge, it would be on the inlet side of the pressure regulator. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. So have you checked the vacuum lines just to double, just double check? Them? I checked all the vacuum lines. I checked the one to the vacuum advance specifically closely. Uh, and I have a vacuum pump that I put on the vacuum advance to make sure it was functioning properly because that was also a thought. Um, and you put the vacuum pump on the vacuum advance directly and you pull vacuum from it and you can watch the distributor move. So I know the vacuum advance is working well. Yeah, I'm worried that there's some sort of vacuum issue with the fuel pressure is not coming up when you go into boost and it's starving for fuel. Like the regular, the little diaphragm of the regular is not pumping up I mean, the pressure. I mean, possibly that fuel pressure regulator isn't that old. I would put it on the car maybe four years ago because the old one sprung a leak. Um, the other thing, I, yeah, the other thing I can think of does these cars must have a knock sensor. Yeah, they have. They call it a knock box, but it's a knock sensor. Yeah, if the connectors, the wiring got chewed through by like a mouse or something, because um, if if these turbo Mitsus, they see any type of knock. They pull timing so hard that the car feels like it falls on its face because it just instantly retards the timing. The car fit, the car stalls. It actually stalls. It shuts off. Like there's no fuel. Yeah. Load. See, they it like pulls timing um, just to prevent the engine from blowing up, from running lean. Right. Uh, but you could also, there's also like a thing where you can have rich knock too, where it can just be dumping too much fuel and it'll just yep. blow the spark out. It does. The car smells rich when it's running. There's no question there. It does. It does smell rich at idle and it does puff a little, you know, black out the back when you first start it, which leads to me to think that the car is running rich in some scenarios. So maybe, maybe it is too rich. Maybe it is blowing the spark out. I don't know. I don't know, but I have checked all the vacuum lines that I can physically put a hand on. Um, and there's nothing, everything's very pliable and very nice. Thanks to you know the car being in New England, the sheet metal might be gone, but the rubber's still good. 
So it's it's not. Uh, yeah, I, I have a high suspicion that it's not vacuum related unless it's in the fuel pressure regulator itself because all the lines seem pretty good and everything's connected where it belongs. So I guess I, I could check the wiring to the knock sensor box before I go too far. That might be. Yeah, make sure it's just connected. There's like these little vacuum solenoids in all these old turbo Mitsus that like have like a little electrical connections to them. And, you know, when you're on a boost controller, you can wire, you can just vacuum line around them. But when the car is stock, they're still there and they like get some sort of little signal and open up and let vacuum and pressure go through and change fuel and stuff like that. So, so I can bypass them with a manual boost controller. Yeah. Hmm. Cause those are like pretty free now too. So that wouldn't be a terrible fix. Yeah. Eliminate all of that. When you, so it should, cause you still have the stock hood. There should be a diagram or, and plus the factory service manager will have the diagram yep. of like where all the lines are going. Well, it's also and an 84. It's just kind of like interrupt. It's also an 84, so it has yeah. a thousand lines under there. Like, it's not a pretty sight. No, and you you basically, to install a boost control, uh, like a manual boost controller, you just vacuum port off of the intake manifold and interrupt. It goes in between that and the vacuum line to the wastegate because you just need a reference pressure from the pressure side holding off to the wastegate. Well, thankfully these cars are these cars are fairly well documented online, so I could probably find exactly how to do it. So maybe that'll be the the next I'm step. sure there's a setup, yeah. Yeah, shouldn't be hard to figure out. All right, well there's there's positives there. I think part of the frustration is that this is only a temporary fix and I know it's frustrating to do this, but I want to make sure everything's right before I start doing it. I want to, I want to have a good base to start from to make sure everything's good before I start, you know, swapping everything over to the other shell. Yeah. Um, and I think that putting a fuel pressure regulator and gauge is not a big deal because, you know, eventually that car is the original turbo on it. Eventually it's going to go and I'll put something slightly nicer on it. And, you know, I'll have to have access to the fuel pressure and, you know, a fuel pressure regulator to make it run right to run the proper level of boost for the new turbo to make the car functional. So I think it's, it's all upgrades that will go on to the new chassis without issue. So not bad things, just expensive things that I don't want to spend right now, but it's okay. We'll make it work. Right. So that's the end of project car updates for the Starion. Um, I do have that 2002 Volkswagen Golf that I've been futzing around with in the driveway. Um, it had a bunch of stickers on it that I was not proud of sitting in my driveway. So the first thing we did was scrape them all off. Um, and then trying to diagnose why there's no, why it's not starting. Just it cranks, 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 no starts. So I checked the obvious stuff first, went and looked at the timing belt to make sure I didn't just lose the timing belt. Uh, timing belt is actually in really good shape. Uh, so that's good. I checked all the obvious stuff, uh, air filter, make sure there was nothing clogging obvious, make sure everything was plugged in. Uh, everything seems good under the hood. There is a plethora of additional wiring that does not belong there because the car was a competition stereo car in its previous life. So it has lots of giant gauge wiring that is scary looking. Um, and I don't know anything about, so that makes me a little nervous. But looking at it, it looks like it's all on top of factory harness so it can be removed without actually changing anything. It looks like it was added on without being spliced into anything. So like there's a couple extra leads coming off the alternator. It's got these giant, you know, aluminum, I assume maybe they're aluminum. I don't know what they're made out of blocks that go on each terminal with the battery that have additional ports coming out of them to power more things. Um, I can get that all out of the car without too much drama. Uh, there is no competition stereo in the car anymore. In fact, there is no stereo in the car anymore. So I'll have to put at least four speakers in it to make it saleable. But step number one is making it run. So I pulled the fuel lines off and cranked the car over. And there was no fuel coming out of the fuel lines. Okay. 
So that usually leads to believe that you have an issue with the fuel pump, right? Yeah. So I went into the back of the car. The fuel pump on those Mark IVs is tremendously easy to access. The f- back seat actually flips forward, and there's a, an access panel that's like a six-inch diameter round plate on the rear floor with three screws holding it on. So I pulled that off. The fuel pump's right there. They say to check the first and fourth connectors on the fuel pump with the voltmeter to see if they pull. I forget the range, um, but it was outside the, the the correct range. So that means the fuel pump is bad. So I went to O'Reilly's. I went to O'Reilly's down the street. Um, a new fuel pump for a two liter Volkswagen Golf was $238. Whoa. I said that seems excessive. Yeah. So I went online as one would do in 2021. Um, and the same fuel yeah, pump is, is factory pump. <laughs> yeah. No, that was for an aftermarket like name I'd never heard of. But the same pump with the same name on Rock Auto was $38. Yeah. That makes sense. So I don't feel bad buying from Rock Auto versus O'Reilly because O'Reilly is just a big corporate company anyway. But even if this was like a small local parts shop, I would still buy it from Rock Auto at this point because $200 is a significant amount of money. If it was like, you know, 20 or $30 different, maybe I would have picked it up locally at a local store, but that's a huge chunk of change. So then I went on Amazon and they had the same pump. I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure the way Rock Auto works is they just buy from a bunch of local uh, parts stores anyways. Yeah, more than likely. But like anyway. They somehow pull the inventory. Yeah. Rock Auto's shipping, though, was like $27 because it's Rock Auto. So oh, I managed for just to, one thing? Yeah, and that's without having any kind of like express delivery. It would have been here in five days. So unfortunately, I had to go to the evil Amazon. Uh, and they had the same pump for forty-two dollars free shipping, next day delivery. So huh. they went again, but the pump got here yesterday. Uh, I was going to install it today, but we're having fifty mile an hour wind gusts outside, uh, and it was super annoying to be out there. So I just came back in the house. So no matter where I go, I can't escape hmm. the bad weather to work on cars. So I have a new fuel pump for it. Uh, I also picked up a fuel pressure regulator for it, just because. The car's got 200,000 miles on it. I might as well make sure everything is healthy. And hopefully when I get that in there, um, the car will start. But I did put the same resistance test on the new pump, and it does show the proper resistance between the connectors, as you would hope it would being a new pump. So hopefully I should be able to plug that in, and it yeah. should just go. So, But that is literally the easiest fuel pump I've ever worked on in a car. It sits in the tank. There are two fuel lines, obviously that are legitimately just pressed on. They're not clipped or screwed or anything. You just put a little screwdriver below them and pry them up and they come right up. Um, And the whole entire assembly is held in with a giant plastic locking ring that Volkswagen suggests you have a special tool to remove, but all you actually really need is a screwdriver and a hammer. And it has all these tabs all around the edge of it. So you can just put the screwdriver on the tab and just tap it with the hammer and it spins the giant ring and just lifts straight out of the tank. No muss, no fuss. I let it hang yep. like halfway out for, I don't know, maybe three or four minutes to drain all the fuel out of it so it didn't drip fuel all over the interior of the car. And uh, it was the easiest fuel hump I've ever taken out of a car. It took like two seconds. So if you ever need a mm-hmm. fuel pump changed in a Mark IV Volkswagen, I'll tell you what, I'm your guy. I can do it real quick now. So it was a pretty pretty easy process. So hopefully I'll slap that in tomorrow and that car by the next podcast will be running. And uh, we'll have something to uh, chat about a little more. That being said, I also went to the junkyard this weekend because the car needs some things. And I learned some facts. All right. So Mark IV Volkswagens, Golfs specifically, go from 99 to 2005? 06? 5 or 06. But did you know? Uh, oh six. But did you know that in ninety nine they were a split year? Yeah, I did know that. I did not know that. So oh, the yeah. first because half I worked at a Bentley, company that yeah. did owner's manuals for them. <laughs> yep. 
So the first half of 99s were marked threes, and the second half of 99s are marked yep. fours. Um, obviously, the local yep. junkyards don't differentiate. They just have them all listed as care. 99s. <laughs> yeah. Which I thought they were wrong at first because I get all the way out there. And, you know, the way these junkyards are organized, some of them are organized kind of by parent manufacturer, like GM, Ford, Volkswagen. Some of them are like American foreign sedan truck. Uh, this one particular one that I went to that had three 99 to 05 golfs was not organized in any of those ways. It was just by row. So you had to walk to your row and then find the car in the row. Um, so after walking pretty much the entire junkyard and every 99 golf in there was a Mark three, I got frustrated and left. So we originally set out because the car needs a few things. Um, like I said, it was originally a stereo car. So the door panels are cut out horribly. They're just, they're a disaster. So I need new door panels. I need a glove box because the glove box was full of amps and they couldn't support the weight and it broke off. <laughs> um, and there was a blue golf listed at the same junkyard that you and I got the Montero parts from. That was the same color blue. Yeah. Um, and the pictures I had seen of the car, it looked pretty cherry on the outside. So I was like, sweet. We're going to go score that front bumper and that hood. Um, and then we'll you know see what else we can grab with the car while we're there. So somebody pulled the engine out of the car. But, of course, they are junkyard animals. Uh, <laughs> and they disconnected the struts yep. on the hood and just flung it back into the windshield. So the mint condition yeah. cherry hood that was in the car when it came into the yard was absolutely annihilated. So the one on my car has got pretty bad paint <laughs> fade. It actually looks like a map almost, the way the paint is faded on it. Um, so I figured it'd be an easy score to grab that. And the front bumper, because the front bumper on my car is black. Uh, but unfortunately, the front bumper was also destroyed by the animals getting the engine out of this car. As was the entire interior. It was like they dumped all the old oil on the driver's seat. Like, it was just absolutely disgusting. So that made me pretty pissed off. Because <laughs> I didn't get any good parts off that car. So I would all, all these junkyards looking for all these parts. And every car was either the wrong generation, even though it was the correct year for the correct generation. Or the car was destroyed. And the other thing I'm running I think into, there's a website is like row row 52. Yeah. And car row 52 and carpart.com are the two websites that uh, you can go to to find parts. But I'm actually having a problem finding door panels because I have never seen this in or even knew it existed, but it's a Mark four two door that has crank windows. So I've never seen a Mark four with crank windows and neither have the junkyards apparently. <laughs> So it's a pretty low option car. I mean, it has a manual transmission, manual windows. Um, I think it factory just had a radio, didn't have a CD or anything. And it just has, uh, it's got AC and that's about it. So. Hmm. It's neat. It's learning. It sounds like a good lemons car. I mean, it could be a good lemons car if I wanted to put that much time and effort into it, but I don't. Uh, the plan with the car is basically just to make it, you know, seed money to get into something else, to get into something else, to get into something else, to eventually get to nice things. So play the uh, play the game of trade up is basically what the car what this is going to be. Mm. And then lastly, project yeah. car update number three is the rear right. lift gate on the daily driver Volkswagen decided to break this week. Oh, right. So that's not fun. Yeah. So <clears throat> the piece inside that holds it either open or closed is plastic. And I guess just after years of opening and closing the hatch, it just gave up and it, decide, it decides on its own when it wants to be latched or unlatched. So I got the latch... I took it all apart, took the barrier panel out, pulled the latch out, pulled the broken pieces out of it. Um, but you put it in the car. If you slam the gate hard enough, it will latch. But as you're driving and it's shaking and rattling around a little bit, it unlatches. So it needs to be replaced. Um, thankfully, that part was like $30 for a new latch on Rock Auto. That one did come from Rock Auto. Uh, cheap. Yeah. Well, a Volkswagen one was 130 So I said... If I buy a $30 latch, 
and it lasts six months, then that sucks, but I've only wasted $30. Where if I buy a $30 latch and it lasts forever, I've saved 100 So that's kind of where I hmm. where I went with it. I don't like buying cheap parts. I want to buy like the good part for the car, but at the same time, that $100 difference was a pretty significant chunk of change. So for not... For an insignificant part of the car, pretty much. It doesn't affect the functionality of the car. I can still drive it. So, anyway. Project car updates completed. Yeah. 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 We're just... We're starting around the corner here. I mean, only a month, and I can put my summer tires on. So... Yeah, that's not bad. We're getting there. That's not bad. No. Not bad at all. There'll be more, more to talk about once you can do things again. Yeah. It's, uh been up and down for weather so maybe in a couple weeks i can do a couple things i've seen some pictures of a few people out there taking cars out today actually so are the roads pretty clear now well in some places like it rained a lot and it was warm but also there's definitely still some like probably road salting contracts. So like the other day it was rain, it was, it was clear and I washed both our daily drivers through the touchless and I go to get on one twenty eight ninety five, and it's covered in salt. And you're like, what? Like it, it's been like 50 degrees and <laughs> yeah, uh, it rained annoying. a day and a half ago. Um, so yeah. And then like parking lots that are like private parking lots, they just have contractors that just come in And if there is any moisture, they're like, put the salt down. Like it looks like, like the, the, my work parking lot, I've been going to the office more. It looks like the Bonneville salt flats. It's crazy. Yeah. I I don't miss that. So that's for sure. No, no. All right. I've got some cars to talk about because, uh, well, we're going to talk about some auction cars that I picked, but also I, I went on and I looked on Craigslist for like some deals. Um, I didn't find one that was a deal, but it was interesting to me because it's advertised in like Brookline, but the car is actually in California. I should hmm. say truck, but it's a Land Rover Series 2109. It's on Craigslist. They want $97,000 for it. That's a long wheelbase, correct? It's a long wheelbase, but it is a resto mod. It's it looks it's a mint sixty four Land Rover one hundred nine wagon body, put on a later Range Rover Classic long wheelbase chassis, with a more modern Range Rover V eight, and a ZF four speed, and permanent all wheel drive, and four wheel disc brakes. So and the interior is completely uh, vintage with the proper gauges. So it's like a very nice truck. I'm sure it drives like a new truck, but it looks like an old one, but it just struck it odd to me that you would put this on Craigslist for almost a hundred thousand dollars. Like, I I don't know. This seems like a prime candidate for an auction site. Well, I think that we're still seeing the shift of people not knowing that auction sites are a legitimate way to try to sell something. Um, Also, probably. Also, I think Land Rovers have a funny place right now because so many of them have been blacklisted by the government and they get bought and crushed because they're technically illegal. So my question with this becomes, how legal is this? Because I'm looking at this quote-unquote body swap that you're talking about, um, and this 94... Uh, sorry, this 64 is not a 64 body either. So it says it's got, I think it's, I think it's a questionably oh. legal vehicle, which means that if it went on a site like bring a trailer, oh, that's why they would probably pull this thing as, you know, VIN swapped or gear swapped or, or something question questionable. Um, yeah. Um, I, I question this vehicle. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and Land Rovers have had that issue for a while where. Yeah, that's ringing a bell now that you're saying that. 
yeah, it, it doesn't mean I wouldn't drive this thing. It's really neat. Um, but everything about it looks too, it looks, it looks too factory to be a resto mod. Because if you're going to build something like this, you would do something a little more, I don't know, something a little different with it. The interior looks too factory. The headlights are definitely from a 90s Land Rover, like the headlight and grill surrounds. The roof is all done up. Well, they're all, you can. Well, it's all bolt on parts. Well, it's all right? like forward and backward compatible. Aren't they? Oh, 100%. But I just think if, if you're going to build something to look like a 64, you're, you, you'd have more 1964. Like, like this thing has got three rows of third of, of shoulder belts in the back. Like that's not something that you would build into your 64. Oh. You know, it's. Oh, it does. Look at that. Wow. Yeah. I just. I, I, I'm, I'm questioning. See, folks, this is. The legitimacy you, of this. <laughs> if you. See. Honestly, uh, anybody that's listening that has questions about a car and like run it by Brad, <laughs> like this is a, uh, I'm I'm telling you the the project car consulting thing is uh, is something yeah. that uh, is useful. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I would I, I would need to go over this car with a fine tooth comb in person, but I bet if we look closely, we'll find some questionable, some questionable VIN swapping techniques going on here. Yeah, or possibly not even. It might it might just actually be a yeah. It's got all modern belts. Oh my god! Yeah, there's, there's too much. It says modern upgrades, but look at that. I'm not loving it, but hey, listen, they somebody maybe somebody did it. Who knows? We'll find out. We won't find out actually because I'm not actually going to actually gonna look at it. But it's a neat proposition. I would spend a hundred right. grand if it was good, legit. So the other one I just uh, recently closed. Accidentally closed it. The other one I'm real into this week, uh, this is on Bring a Trailer, is a modified 1990 Volvo 740 GLE with a four speed and a oh, weird. I didn't really read the description. It spent time in Guam before being imported to the US. In yeah, and then it's been all over the US. That's why it's so clean. Yeah. Plus, it hasn't been in New England wow. for more than a year. Uh, no. So the cool thing is it's got, uh, if you know anything about Volvos, you're familiar with modifying Volvos, you've heard of Yoshi Fab. Guy does a lot of custom parts for Volvos and build stuff. And it's got, a, the car has a cool, it's a, a B234, and it's a 16 valve inline four, but it's a dual cam. And it was like a one year only engine for 740s. And I don't think they came with manuals, so this is swapped. Well, it's it's not a U.S. market car, so I think that there might be some different differences from overseas. So they wouldn't have sold a four-speed in this country either at that time. It's a it's a four-speed with electronic overdrive, which is neat. Um, but I also noticed there's like a, a heck of blend on the trunk where it kind of brings the taillights together across the middle. Uh, and these are all you know foreign market. I wonder if this was sold new in Guam. And has some weird Guam features. Well, maybe because I mean it's U.S. territory, like Puerto Rico, but I think it's easier to get non-U.S. market cars in the territories. Yeah, they have different rules. It's still it's, yeah. still its own country. No, it's a territory. Oh, is it? Well, I'm not going to speak it's too much like about Port- that. Guam is just like Puerto Rico. I don't I don't know how that those Guam laws work. Guam is just like Puerto Rico. <laughs> But I don't think that Volvo sold a four-speed in the United States at that moment in time. It's got Euro headlights. But on it too. it's this is super cool. So I'm yeah. not I'm not saying it's it's poor in any way. I think it's awesome. I, I would definitely buy this car, and you know I don't know what kind of bid it's going to wind up at. It's currently at 500 bucks, but still is you know six days to go. So yeah, but I dig this. Yeah, hilariously, some joker. Has uh, bid five hundred dollars because all Volvos are only worth five hundred dollars. Well, you got to start somewhere, and it does have some a little bit of surface rust on the chassis, and the frame rails are crushed a little bit. It looks like from use, but it's definitely a clean car, and it's it's like it's everything that your first car could have been but wasn't. So the next one I got a uh, modified nineteen ninety Volkswagen Jetta GLI sixteen valve five speed. 
Also so a bring a trailer it's car. Sedan. Kind of it's red. Yep. Super cool. Like just I don't know. I'm more into Volkswagens now than I have been. <laughs> well, I've always been into Mark Ones and Mark Twos. Um for those that are into them, this is a nineteen ninety GLI. So it's basically a four door sedan version of the GTI. Uh, it has the sixteen valve. It's a aero headlight, big bumper car with the big flares uh, and has the big doors, as they're called, meaning no vet windows. So it's a later model, as it should be for 1990. Um, it does have wheels on it that are too big, um, but that's easy enough to change. Um, the good things in the car, it does have an LSD and it has the five speed with the diesel transmission fifth gear swap, which is huge because that's such a great for like long distance cruising, it drops the revs in the highway, you know, a thousand RPM almost from the standard five speed. So this is, this is the way I would, I would build one almost exactly, uh, minus the big bumpers and big wheels. I go small bumpers and small wheels, but I'm, uh, I'm way into it. And it has their gray Recaro trophy seats with the red stripe interior too. So this is an ideal, like daily driver, fair weather, daily driver car. It's, it's super cool. Yeah, it's very it's, cool. It's how I would have built one. Back when I was younger, I remember being a kid, being a teenager and looking at Mark II Volkswagens and, you know, wanting one in the worst way and looked at a few of them. Never pulled. Actually, I did have one for a short period of time, but I never actually drove it. Um, And thinking that when I'm an adult, I'm going to have a real job and real money and I'm going to build the coolest Mark II Volkswagen ever. And then adult happened and I never did it. And now they're expensive. (laughs) So... Well, maybe that's one of your trading up cars. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe I should get to experience a Mark a Mark II. Yeah. I, like I said, I owned one for a while. I bought it with a blown head gasket. I, I'm sure you remember the car, Andrew. It was the I do. Micah Red two-door Golf GTI. Um, I bought it on the side of the road broken where it broke down and uh, dragged it home and uh, actually got it put back together. And we got it started. Um, and then somebody offered me like twice what I was into it for. So I sold it before I ever drove it. <laughs> so, hmm. so I've never actually owned one. I've driven a few over the years, and they are they are fun. They're pretty lightweight, you know, point and shoot kind of cars, kind of like you know your Civic Si was. They're they're great cars, and <clears throat> watching the market on them, watching this one on Bring a Trailer, you know, that's what this segment is really about: is talking about you know where the market is on these cars and what they're selling for. And this car ends tomorrow. At about four o'clock my time, so it's you know midday on the East Coast, Andrew, um, and it's only at fifty five hundred bucks. Yeah, so that's the kind of car you can buy and enjoy, and and really not lose much money on, as long as you take good care of it. You know, I I suspect it will go a little higher by the time the sale price goes, but you know I'd be surprised if it sells for more than seven grand, eight grand. That sounds about right. Yeah, and that's like I said, that's the kind of money you can be into a car and and enjoy it and not uh, not lose any money when it comes time to sell it. You know, it's 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 easy to sell a car in the five to seven thousand dollar range. So I'm way into it. I would definitely drive it. I would definitely All drive right. it. The final one I'm into on Bring a Trailer. I had a couple more after this, but those are on cars and bids. Uh, 95 Bronco XLT 4x4 five speed finished in four service green two tone with the white center. Yeah, that thing is dumb nice. It's wicked dumb nice. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why I would want it, but it's cool. Like, yeah, I don't know either. I, I grew up in these things. I'm sure you remember my dad had these. Like the last one he had was a 90, 91 or 90. It had it was uh, the same center color, same roof color, but it was maroon. Where this one is forest service green. Um, yeah, it, it's it's pretty cool. I it's probably like not that great to drive because I always forget until I get into them that '90s Fords are like not that great. No, uh, I can not. I can I can hear the power steering pump whining on it. Yep. Um, but it's pretty cool. Like. It's definitely gets a uh, sensification. Yeah, it certainly does. And that whole back half of the roof comes off. You know, it is a five liter, so it'll have that, 
you know, Mustang Burble. It is a manual transmission, so it'll be, you know, somewhat entertaining to drive. You know, it's not going to be fast. It's 195 horsepower and it probably weighs, you know, 5,500 pounds, but it will certainly be faster than a Montero. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, the, not looking for speed in one of these. It's too nice to go beaten off road, but at the same time you could go, it'd be a neat, like, you know, light duty camping kind of vehicle. But no, I, I dig it 100%, and the colorway is awesome. I uh, I have the a long time wish list for some former Forest Service vehicle. Yeah. So, no, I did that color green. It's, it's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. There's a um, mid 60s Dodge pickup in my area here that's Forest Service green that I see from time to time. And uh, it makes me a little bit jealous that it's not mine. <laughs> that's super cool. It's kind of like a sea foamy green. And mm-hmm. depending on what year, there are a few different tints of the color. But I dig it. It's cool. All right. Over on Cars and Bids, this is actually the last 90s car. Uh, 93 BMW 525i sedan with a five speed mil- uh, five speed manual. Calypso red. It's a cool color. It's a cool color. It's a cool car. I think these five series are really attractive uh, in this generation. The first three generations of five series are amazing looking cars. Yep. No question. The E28. um, And then I don't know the E39, I think is the final of the three. And I don't know what this one is. E35, maybe? E34. 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 So yeah, those in E28, fun fact, was the car I was looking to buy when I wound up in my Audi 4000. Um, but we just couldn't find a not rotted to death one in New England. I think you went with me to look at that one down the Cape that had no front wheels. Yeah. What a disaster. It looks so nice otherwise. But yeah, these are these are neat cars. Um, they're the last of the, for lack of a better word, simple BMWs. There's not a lot to be scared of buying an older one. Um, the 7 Series is a different story because they're a lot more complicated with electronics, but the 5 Series is still a fairly usable car, even at this age. Uh, and they're just, they're handsome, I guess is the good word for these cars. They, they, have, they have a presence. You know, they're, they're a big car. They look cool going down the road, and they're comfortable, and they're but they feel a lot smaller than they, they feel smaller than they are. So I like these. I think if you get this, I mean, it's got five days left. It's already at six grand. Uh, if you can get it for under 12, it's probably a really good buy. Uh, yeah, it's got 150K on it, which is, as long as it's been maintained, that's not too too bad. It's a 525, so it's a six cylinder, so it's a very simple motor to work on. Um, it's like a 200 horse, I think. Not, Something like that, yeah, probably. Nothing spectacular, just a nice cruiser. This would be a good car to get in and just, you know, drive from Massachusetts out here to Phoenix. You know, it'll be a super comfortable long yeah. bomb highway cruiser. And, you know, people that are looking for like Radwood type cars, but are worried about spending too much money. Like that's a, that's an outsider type car. It's not a three series. It's yep. a five series. Yeah. You can get a lot nicer car for less money by buying a five series versus a three series. It's, and it's still got all that presence of a, of a nineties BMW. Yeah. Not the truth when you put the M badge in front of it, but for a non M car, the uh, five series is definitely a better buy now. Yeah. And same with E 28s in the, in the eighties and E 34s in the nineties, definitely mm-hmm. better than E thirties. E 36s are still pretty cheap for non M cars. Um, but I think it's a more handsome car than an E 36. And it's, it's the gentleman, the gentleman's choice. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, last one for me. And this one's kind of an outside pick. Oh, eight BMW X three. 30SI with a six speed auto off podcast canceled. So it's, I like these. They were, and I have a soft spot because I, I, one of the things I did at Bentley was did the owners, uh, not the owner's manual, did the service manual for these X3s. So this is a first gen, but it's a facelifted uh, late version. So it doesn't, it doesn't have the black cladding that the early ones have. Uh, and this is black on black and with the six speed. So it's basically, these are essentially lifted E46s. 
but it's got a lot of utility that an E46 doesn't have. So as far as like putting stuff in it and being a manual, it's a pretty good sleeper and it has almost like 300 horsepower. So it's a pretty cool car. Mm. I can't, mm. can't do it. Mm. I don't know. I, I, I guess my problem is it's not quite an SUV and it's not like, it's not something I'd take off roading, but it's also not no. a sports car. So to me, it kind of loses that. Like I'd, I'd rather have a wagon. I'd rather have an E forty six wagon than an X. Yeah. Um. But if you wanted something a little taller to get into, I'm not that old yet, um, Andrew. I don't know. I think it's a cool car. It's definitely a, a sleeper status. It's it probably is entertaining to drive, but again, it's that. Uh, I don't know. It's it's that. If you can only have one car, I guess maybe, and that gives a big maybe. And you live in New England, you need all-wheel drive. But again, the wagon was also available in all-wheel drive. So, yeah, maybe if I you're looking for an E46 style chassis and you want a wagon and you want a manual and you want all-wheel drive, and this is the only thing that comes up available, I guess I could I could see it. But it just blends in too much as a normal plebeian commuter car. You know, it's it's that CUV that everybody has. It's I don't know I don't I don't love it I can't I can't get behind it sorry I'm into it all right That's what fine. do you got all right I went a little different when we talked about doing auction picks um, yep. one of the things that I'm always spouting off is to buy the car that you want not buy the car everybody tells you you want right so a big part of that is the amount of car you get for the money you're spending should have a driving experience worth the money you're spending. Meaning there's no reason to buy a a top of the line, low mile, perfect 1991 Miata when there's a perfectly acceptable, good condition, 150,000 mile car for, you know, half the price or sometimes even, you know, a third or a quarter of the price in that situation. Um, so I got to thinking about what are some cars that are on the market that have always interested me. They're always been outside my price range. Uh, even as I've gotten older and my price range has expanded a little, these have gone up beyond my price range. Uh, and my brain went automatically to Porsche, but that's the obvious choice. Um, you could say, you know, you don't need a 911, you know, short wheelbase when you can get away with half the price of a, you know, mid nineties, 964 Carrera two, but that's the easiest choice. Uh, I kept thinking about it a little more and my brain went right to alpha. I have always been huge into a GTV, which is the, I think they call them the alpha one Oh five or the alpha one fifteen is the chassis code. Okay. It's basically the two door alpha that you picture. When you picture uh, 60s, early 70s, you know, Alpha Touring car, race car style. A GTV? Yeah, GTV, like a 2-liter or 1.8, I think they are. Or, yeah, like a 1750 okay. or something like that. Um, so these cars have always been on my radar, but they've never been in my budget. So, you know, at this point in time, here in March of 2021, these cars sell... For usually in the $40,000 range and up. So I looked in on Bring a Trailer. Um, There were a couple of bargains that popped up on there, but they're few and far between, and most of them are a bargain for a reason. You know, they need some work. They're not sorted. You don't just get them and drive them home. Uh, I know that, you know, all alphas are going to be slightly questionable when it comes to reliability, but that's part of the charm of owning an alpha. So a a good GTV 2000 or GTV 1750, you know, I'm seeing them from 40,000 to 50,000 with some real nice cars up in the seventies and eighties. So that's a lot of money for a small seventies Italian car with questionable reliability, right? So it is. And it's not a Ferrari. It's not a Ferrari. Yeah. So one of the things that got me thinking about this was just last week or maybe the week before on Bring a Trailer, there was a 71 Alfa Romeo GTV 
Uh, it had some wide body fender flares of you love them or hate them. Um, I don't love them. I would live with them if it was the right price, but it's definitely not my style for a build. Um, but I was washing the car because it had some rust repair that was done. And then it had, instead of repairing it properly, they stuck these big fiberglass fender flares on there. And I was like, oh, that might be a, you know, a cheap way to get into a GTV. You know, it's perfect for somebody like me who doesn't want to spend a ton of money, but wants to have the driving experience of that car. So this is a 1750 GTV 1971. So I watched it, uh, not in the position to buy it, but just to kind of be curiosity of, you know, this kind of vehicle that I could potentially see myself in, what kind of money is going to go to. The car had a reserve. Uh, it only bid to $28,000 and didn't sell. In my mind, twenty eight grand is all the money for this car because it's not perfect. I can't, right. I can't imagine spending any more than that on this car. In fact, I can't imagine spending that on this car it's neat it's got dual webers it's got you know nice race seats it's it's it has the look um but it's it's a little tatty and uh yeah it's not original yeah uh it's not a singer version of an alpha no it's somebody's home built hot rod yeah and it's not like yeah it's not like an r group porsche or something yeah so i i think that it's it's just it's just not quite there. You know, it has the big fender flares, but doesn't have a ton of performance modifications. So I, I, I was curious to see where it was gonna go. It landed around thirty grand, didn't sell. Um I think the car's probably worth about thirty grand, but you know, that's my un knowledgeable, just kind of outside looking in. I'd have to do a little more research to put an actual value on it. But just watching other cars for sale, I don't see why it wouldn't be why it would be any any more money. So then I got to thinking if I wanted an alpha I can still get into a 105, which is the same chassis, but I could buy a sedan. Right. It's the same car. Um, they come with a 1300 or a two liter. I mean, the 1300 is not going to be a race car on you know straight line, but they used them in touring car style racing. Uh, the two liters for sure. Um, if you were inclined to a two liter from a very available alpha convertible like one of the you know 70s or 80s spiders that's the same two liter motor in there you could swap that in fairly inexpensively so i started looking at these sedans and for half the price of a coupe you can have the same driving experience as these sedans so i don't understand why there's any reason to buy the coupe other than everybody says you have to buy the coupe right yeah i suppose i mean we should buy these uh, Julia sedans from the seventies, you know, a a nice car can be had for 20 grand, a car very similar to that $30,000 no sale hot rod went recently on bring a trailer. Um, It was a white car on, you know, ultralights with, you know, no bumpers, half cage, the same kind of home built hot rod uh, period style buckets, momo steering wheel, all the good stuff went for $20,000. And, Every bit of fun as that coupe, just with four doors, and you can have the same stories that you had in your Alpha Coupe. So I just kind of want to take this moment to to say, like, this is the actual use case of the buy the car you want, not the car everybody tells you you have to buy. Because this thing is, it's exactly the same car underneath. It just isn't a four well, sedan body. Yeah, there's that, and there's also um, look for alternatives. Right. So, you know, you can, you want the alpha experience. Okay. But the two doors are very expensive. So if you're not willing to spend that much, go down the line and figure out what would be the alternative, which is what you've shown here is a four door. It's the same car. It just, I don't know. It's not as cool because it's a four door, but uh, I mean, if they, it's still an Italian car, so it still looks really pretty. Yeah. They're still pretty cars. Yeah, it's not like my – I have a very strong opinion on – I don't think four-door 240s and four-door 140s are as good-looking as the two-doors. For whatever reason, they just – I think they're much more svelte. We're talking about Volvos but, now? Volvos? Yeah. See – But and the, but like on a on like a 57 Chevy or, or a Tri-5 Chevy, uh, the difference between a four-door and a two-door – 
isn't as dorky either. Like they still look pretty good as four doors. And I think that you're narrowing your mindset on the Volvos because you've looked at them so much. I think that the same person, you as an alpha person, probably be saying the same thing about the four door alpha. Um, because you are so used to looking at the two doors. That's what you want as a two door and that you're just, you're set in your ways. The other thing is, is that a four door 240 Volvo and a two door 240 Volvo aren't hugely different in price because they don't have that stigma that some of the other cars do. I've noticed. No, but also like even the only examples I have, like a, like a G, a Subaru GC coupe and a Preza. Okay. And a GC stand. They're both pretty good looking. Sure. Uh, they did a pretty good job, even though like a sedan does feel longer, even though it's the same. Um, but I think the again, the the appeal for the coupe comes from everybody thinks they're going to build a 22B clone or something. Right. But again, I don't think there's a huge, is there a huge price difference on a two door to a four door? I think it's uh, probably a few grand for a nice one. Okay. You know, nice to nice. It's probably a few grand. But also... I think the going with what you should, you know, not what people tell you to buy, what you should buy or what you want to buy. Where am I going? Um, who am I? Um, is uh, if I were to get a GC, I would totally skip on a USDM car because they're, it's like five or eight grand for a clean four door or coupe when you can, for a little bit more money, import. A WRX, a GC yeah. WRX. Yeah, the 25 are, RS has a huge tax on it right now. And I don't care about all your, oh, you can swap. I don't I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, it's better to get it from the factory. You're, <laughs> you're, yeah, your backyard swap is not going to be as engineered as well yeah. as a WRX that came off the assembly line. Well, I, I think that you have a, a couple of good points there, but sticking back to the Alfa Romeo thing, I mean, t- 20 grand is still a lot of money for a car. It's not like it's you know, a $500 throwaway. It's still an expensive car. Um, and then I think that what you have to do after that is look to other alternatives that aren't alphas. You know, what? what's the equivalent, you know, same era, independent suspension, four-cylinder car would be a Datsun 510 or a BMW 2002. Oh, well, yeah. And I think well, that they're less than alphas. Uh, 2002s are barely less than alphas. Yeah, but they're, they are less. Uh, and the five ten and the five ten is barely less than that, so you can still yeah. get into a four door five ten in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range. So, again, another car that um, doesn't look bad as a, a sedan. No, um, looks a little better as a coupe. Well, it's a lot better as a coupe, but it looks a little better as a two door sedan. Yeah, yeah. There's a coupe version that wasn't sold here. That's night oh, and day okay. better than than the others, but. And you couldn't get a. There was no four door two thousand twos. No, there would have been a like a sixteen hundred no. new class. No, that wasn't until like an E twenty E twenty one. Well, they had, they they had a, a four door car. It was just a whole different car. Um, it was oh, very. Right, right, they, had, right. they had the. I don't remember the chassis number. I'm not gonna know. They called it a sixteen hundred. Um, oh yeah, I've seen one. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are decent cars, Impressive. and I I think that they're less than two thousand twos, but I could be wrong. I think they're like almost not desirable. Or, yeah, or, but they look good done upright, and you probably have the same driving experience yeah. as a sixteen hundred two thousand two. Yeah. I, I again, I don't, I don't know enough about that to speak on it. I would have to, I would have to look. I mean, um, I don't. They're not like a thousand bucks, but I don't think they're two thousand two money. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was just actually, I just while we're tra- chatting about it, I looked at the most recent auctions on Bring a Trailer. And without yeah. looking too deep into them, I see there are quite a few on here that sold, you know, the 1600 coupes or early 2002s, they like before they were called 2002s. There's a couple on here that sold around 10 grand. Uh, I'm guessing they're not super nice cars, but they're probably also not terrible. One of them I've seen in person. It's actually uh, four till four cafes, 68, which is definitely a, a ratty driver quality car, and that's over 10 grand. So. I can't think of anything else that would be. Toyota didn't have, really have anything at that time. Well, they had a TE twenty-seven, but it was a solid axle. Yeah. So that's a whole other class of car. That's the 
the Ford Escort, the Mitsubishi Lancer slash Dodge Colt, the um, Toyota Corolla TE27. That's a whole different the, uh, yeah. o- Opal uh, Escanas, and that's a whole different class of car. That that solid rear axle, I think, makes makes all the difference in the world in those cars. They're yeah, not gonna I think be Nissan as, went after the Alphas and the BMWs. They did, but they also had a solid rear axle car. They had in other markets it was called the Sunny. Uh, here it was called Datsun 1200. So they had that too. But I'm looking at 2002s now. And then recent sales, I don't see one less than 20 grand for a while. Yeah. So at least the early, the, the late model ones are a little less desirable. Here's one for 13. But it was no sales. There's a 74 sold for 18. Project car for 10. So yeah, they're not. Uh, they're not cheap in the bring a trailer think, world anyway. There's not really much else in that era. Uh, I don't think there's anything French that was rear drive, independent suspension. Mm, nothing in this class of car. No, that's they, what I'm saying. Yeah, there would have been. I'm trying to think of alternatives. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you go to England and MGB GT. That's a solid rear axle. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, Spitfire GT6 would have independent suspension. Yeah. Uh, Triumph, a terrible car. <laughs> uh, no, it's not a terrible car. I think the GT6 is a good car. And actually, I think, uh, t- to pendantic correct myself, the GT6 was not a Spitfire. It was just a GT6, but it's yeah. the same basic chassis. Um, there were there, there were a few. Um, Triumph had the Dolomite, which they didn't sell here, which was basically Spitfire-style suspension all around. Um hmm. But then there was the Hillman, which would be the solid axle version to go with the Ford Escort. So there's there's a lot of neat little cars from the era. You just got to kind of expand your horizons a little bit outside of Alphas and BMWs and Datsuns, I guess. So, which is why I have Colts, yeah. and you know people will make fun of me for driving '70s economy cars. But again, the Colt in the rest of the world was known as kind of a a world beating rally car. So I'm just gonna change its image here with. One colt at a time. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. Speaking of interesting stuff from the 70s, uh, this weekend, if you're in Arizona, um, we are having, I should I say we, but they, a group is having a vintage Japanese car meet on Saturday. So, let's, today is the third. So, I think that's the, or is the fourth, fifth, sixth? I guess. Oh, wait, is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Oh, now I'm giving oh, I don't know. now I'm giving bad information. I thought it was Saturday, but I, then I was thinking that they had the seventh. So today's anyway, the third. We're, we're recording it on Wednesday, right? Which is why I'm trying to. This will probably go out tomorrow morning. So it's going on Friday. Let me just pull up the account real quick and make sure I can uh, give the correct date here. You also mentioned to me you were going to go to four till four this weekend because they're doing. A I Porsche am day. going to four till four this weekend for Porsche Day. Actually, um, Bradley Brunell is in town of uh, Radwood and Jalopnik and, and Flat Sixes dot com and EV Pulse and Auto Autopia. Um, he's a big Porsche guy. I know a bunch of Porsche people, and he happens to be in town this week for the. Uh, he's not here for that, but he's here the same day as it. So it looks like the show is on March 7th. So it's Sunday, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So Sunday at noontime is the South. It's at South mountain in Arizona, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it's the Arizona Japanese vintage car club is putting on an yep. event. So it looks like there's going to be possibly a few hundred cars there <laughs> with people yeah, coming from so, as far as away as Vegas and, you know, almost Mexico and New Mexico and California. So it should be, yeah. should be a good time. I'm, I'm looking, so looking forward to that. And go check it out. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, so Bradley's in town. Uh, we're going to go to four till four this Saturday. Uh, it's Porsche day at four till four. That's usually between the hours of like seven and 10, usually between eight and 10 is probably the biggest, the biggest draw. Um, so we'll be there for a while for that. So if you're in the area, come on out and check it out. Cool. All right. Where can they find you, Brad? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at TSISS350. Follow me on the socials at uh, Race and Anger. 
Uh, follow us on Off Topic on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. And uh, as always, keep cars analog and aim for the roses. Yeah.